This webinar is the first of a series that you may look forward to following. Future webinars can and will look forward to discussing topics such as Indigenous food sovereignty, um, Indigenous medicines or traditional medicines, um, and the intersection of COVID and extraction projects, plus more as we develop more um, interest and ideas that come our way. As part of today's webinar, we welcome questions. We will reserve time at the end of this webinar to answer some of them. So please keep adding your questions through your uh, Facebook comment section, or if you've joined us by Zoom, you can add them through a chat as well. And we will keep track of that and be able to address some of these at the end of our uh, session today. So, before, uh, without my, uh, further ado, I think that we're quite excited, uh, excited to start this. And so we're going to do a brief uh, introduction with everyone. I'm going to start here with Taylor Gallivan and Dylan Kenzik. Wave for us, please. <laughs> awesome. Um, Dylan is a land-based researcher with Winniskatan and communication coordinator for the Kiskina Makiwin, did I say that right? I hope so, uh, project. He's also the vice president of the University of Manitoba's Indigenous Concerns on the Environment. Could you tell us a little bit more about yourself, please? Hi there, bonjour. Uh, yeah, so my name is Dylan. Yeah. I'm currently in my fifth year of the next September or this upcoming September. And um, yeah, my focus is environmental studies with plant biology and um, conservation and restoration mostly that's that's kind of what I study and uh, the Kiskinamakuin program um, I was able to to engage with them last summer after volunteering with with one of the camps and after that experience I just really enjoyed it and I wanted to to further my uh, my education and and um, career, I guess, or, or job at least with them. So that's kind of a uh, little bit about me. Wonderful. And what is the Kiskanama Kuin? Is that how you say it? I'm sorry if I slaughtered that. What is that project? <laughs> Kiskanama Kuin. So what? <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's, um, it's basically a project that focuses on organizing science camps in different um, First Nation communities, um, mostly hydro impacted communities. And what these camps focus on is, is mainly the science behind, like environmental science and kind of incorporating the community's traditions. And these camps, uh, they range from a day long to three, three to four days long. And they, it, the main focus is, is the water quality due to um, obvious concerns of water quality in, in different communities. So that's kind of the focus and it's really fun. And, they, and the youth that attend, uh, their age ranges anywhere from, what, eight, eight years old to 18. So quite a diverse age group. Is there, do they all follow the same idea? the same program or do you have age then separated into age categories? Yeah, so um, obviously they'll have different interests depending on their age. So last year they kind of divided up the camps in, into those categories and also as together, uh, big group activities together as well. Um, but this also gives the youth an idea of kind of how you know well we'll give them an idea of what university is like and kind of the different tools that are used in 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 labs and um that kind of stuff too Wonderful. writing papers all that fun stuff that's awesome thank you taylor taylor is the land-based edu uh, education coordinator for kiss can kiss and holds several kiss can how is that right kiss can Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and holds several other roles, including podcaster, and she's the president of uh, uh, UMICE as well, which is the University of Manitoba and Indigenous Concerns on the Environment. Taylor, could you give us some insight into the programs and the work that you do? Oh, my goodness. Uh, all right. So, as the coordinator, what we would normally be doing um, pre COVID, 
At this time, we'd be planning all of our camps in different communities across Manitoba and Northwestern Ontario. The camps that we had planned were mostly in Northern Manitoba for this coming year, including Grassy Narrows. But unfortunately, due to the events that are happening around the world, the pandemic, all of our camps have been postponed and or canceled. So now, we're trying to make a transition and uh, like trying to work with the communities to find other ways to promote land-based education. So currently what we're doing is working on online modules, lesson plans, activities, not for the communities to use as a curriculum at, in any way, but just as additional resources that they can use to provide additional activities with the youth during the course of the summer, whether communities allow land-based camps to happen but so hopefully I mean it becomes useful in some way to to the communities we were going to visit and other communities as well and then also what else did you do you want me to talk about like you mice and stuff as well or uh yeah I wanted to find out what you uh, mice is all about and then a little bit about your podcast please Oh, sure. Uh, so You Mice is a group that I kind of started and am the president of, which is an Indigenous student group on at the University of Manitoba. What we do is we promote uh, traditional knowledge and activities for Indigenous and non-Indigenous students at the university. So, for example, we, for the first time ever at, in the university's history, we, we brought in a deer and then we butchered it and skinned it uh, right there at Migazi Agamic, which was super awesome. And then in December, you mice and you missa, which is another student group, uh, we joined forces and we had a big traditional Christmas feast with that with that deer, as well as uh, we filleted fish and it was really Wild awesome. Rice. And then we also do our circle talks, which features traditional knowledge holders and elders to come and just provide some insight into whatever they're comfortable speaking about, whether that's land-based education, health, food sovereignty. So we do that. And then on top of that, uh, started a <laughs> podcast called Akiwan, which is Ojibwe for it is the land, the earth, and it is an environmental podcast that focuses on environmental issues but from an indigenous person's perspective that indigenous person being myself as well as bringing in other guests academics students elders community members to come and speak about whatever that episode may be about whether it's our first episode was about land-based education um, and this week's episode which is coming out on friday is about uh just the events that are occurring in our daily lives and how we as indigenous people are are coping with with the with the COVID nineteen self isolation and how we are bringing how so many people now are going back to the land, which is super exciting to see all over social media. I'm very excited and very jazzed to see all of that happening. And then I think that's it. I have many other hats that I wear, but we'll just leave it at that. And you uh, do, <laughs> uh, so, and very successful. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, I'm going to go over to Nikki. I'm going to introduce Nikki. Nikki Furland is a Métis woman who is completing her Master's of Indigenous Land-Based Education at the University of Saskatchewan. She is currently the coordinator of the Land and Water Program at the University of Manitoba, and that's through the Community Service Learning. Nikki, could you give us a little more insight into who you are and what you do, please? Sure. Kanche, Nikki, Dishnikashon, Niamichif, Dizestri, uh, Lorette Igwa St. Vitel Doschin, Winnipeg Niwikin Avik Mapam, Chantel Fiola. Uh, so that was a little Michif introduction. Um, so I was raised in a Lorette, Manitoba, which is a small Metis parish town. Um, and then in my when I was about 10 years old, I moved to the city um, and grew up in St. Vitel. Um, both of my parents are Metis. Uh, my my mother, I like to sort of establish who I am as a Metis person. So uh, my mother's grandfather was André Beauchemin, who was the MLA for St. Vitel and Louis Riel's provisional government, elected uh, into that riding in 1870. Um, and then my, my father's grandfather actually established um, the, the settlement of Lorette, Manitoba, with other Métis uh, buffalo hunters and farmers in the sort of late uh, 1800s-ish. And so and my family's been there ever since. Um, as you mentioned, I'm working on my master's uh, of education in the Indigenous land-based education concentration at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, actually, Alex Wilson is my supervisor, so it's great to be here with her. Um, 
I'm completing my thesis this summer, which I was really focused on urban Métis land-based education here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, and I am the community engaged learning coordinator indigenous at the University of Manitoba and so um, essentially what I do in that role is help connect students to community and, and help them cultivate a community mindset. Um, and in that position I run the land and water program which is land based education uh, program that brings together a post secondary team with the high school students um, to really like learn about uh, indigenous people's connections with the land to develop connections between them and to help them explore their own um like desire to work in like land defense and climate action wonderful wonderful thank you i'm gonna go off to omar and crystal welcome omar and crystal omar and crystal are knowledge keepers in Opaskwak Cree Nation, and they mentor youth through land-based education uh, by revitalizing learning on the land with activities to keep youth in school and engaged. Can you tell us a little bit more about your role, Omar? Okay. Um, see if my mic is on here first. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Can you hear me? Very well. Oh. All right. So I'll start here. Um, and I work with the Pasquiac Education Services in, in OCN with uh, Oscar Lath and Collegiate. Currently, I am a career, uh, career guidance counselor and have been in the classroom for the last 12 years before that. So with, with uh, um, my involvement with the students in terms of land base, I have worked in the school system. I've taken students on, on different field trips, whether it was uh, a school group or uh, part of the programming that we offer within our outdoor, ed, outdoor education programs. And then in the, the at the local level in our community, we are involved with different programming. Um, if different organizations are hosting a program, uh, we are there to assist them. And just like we're doing here today, people reach out to us and, and ask, ask us to provide some input. So going back to the school aspect of things, um, you know, we all are uh, impacted right now with COVID-19 and um, the planning that we had is also on a standstill and we're hoping you know for the new school year this is something that will be lifted and we can resume with our normal programming that we have for our students especially with uh, getting them out to the land and, and maintaining that aspect for them in, in learning is there anything else <laughs> all right don't worry I have been on the land ever since I was uh, probably four years old. Harvest my first bird when I was five, my first moose when I was seven. And I had a passion for the land and I went through different hunters, pick out different areas and tools that worked and then I could incorporate my own style. So with OES, we had the opportunity to work with them for, for the last 20 years. This day today, we're supposed to have a big cultural piece for our community where we use our land-based students to go engage in collecting of moose, uh, ducks, fish, muskrats, uh, and everything for the community in that part of it. But because of this COVID-19, we kind of shut down all the events on that part of it. But I've been on the land. What we do is I work with an instructor named Randy Cochell at the high school level. And with there, he does with the GPS training and with there, we show them the waterways, uh, the lakes, the rivers, the landmarks, uh, get them into what's beyond OCN or other areas in that part of it. The beauty of our program, we like to go north, east, west, south. We had a plan to Churchill to go hunt geese uh, about five days ago. We we're supposed to leave on May 8th. But because of this COVID-19, uh, they had to cancel that trip. So that was just to show you that we like to take our students up and beyond different areas of well, to see what's beyond OCN. And that was the whole time. That's the beauty of our program. Uh, I don't know what else I can say, but I want to say thanks to Alex there for introducing me to all our students throughout the different years. Uh, they're able to share our, our knowledge that was passed on from my mom, my dad, and my grandpa and uncles and all that. 
So that's what I bring to the table on that part of it. Your traditional teachings as far as it goes with how we interact out there. And number one, we're always looking at safety. And that's the big thing about our program is that if you're going on the boat, you want to have 20 people on the boat, right? So we look at safety as a, as a big part of our component. And basically, once you're able to, we do put a lot of students to the program. Uh, at first, we used to work from the grade seven and eights, nine and 10, 11 and 12. We did different seasonal summer, I mean, seasonal fall, winter. Uh, we do all the trap line on OCN. So we take the students out there to show them different animal tracks, how they set uh, the, the for, for a fur nap and how to prepare the animal, get ready for marking on that part of it. So that's what we do together between myself and Randy Cushell. We're a great team. Uh, we change to the weather, we adapt to the change. We might have something set for today, but based on the weather conditions, we would kind of move it and have something else in mind that we would plan for them. So we're in the hunting season now. So tomorrow I'm going hunting. <laughs> like I said. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you too. I was also a counselor for OCN for about nine years. And in that nine year term there, I worked with natural resources. So that was another area that we were able to go see our land with their boat and that. But at the same time, there was also programs that was offered through Manitoba Hydro that we engage our students in. So we did water sampling, our traditional territory areas. Uh, they went and uh, collected muskrats, burbots. We sent them over to, or Mariah, we sent them out to Edmonton there to get sent different samples. So we also engage our students on that. And I can guarantee you the seven and eight girls were on Rocky Lake collecting burbot from eight o'clock to 12 o'clock at night. And I commend them for them. They outfish the boys. <laughs> so that was just one of the areas there that we do work with Matuba Hydro. Uh, we do have two uh, location sites, one located at Saskram and the other one's located at Stony Point. That's um, where um, Sandy would take her, her master group out there. And we do have a road out there now, Sandy, so it's all gravel, so we're good to go with the vehicles, just to let you know that. Thank you, Seth. thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, um, Alex is joining us from, Dr. Alex Wilson is joining us from her home in Opasquiak Cree Nation. She's a professor at the University of Saskatchewan in the Department of Educational Foundations and is also the director of the Aboriginal Education Research Center there. Her work focuses on land-based education and land protection, particularly in the Saskatchewan River Delta. Welcome, Dr. Wilson. Can you explain more of who you are and what you do, please? Yeah, Tatsi, hi everyone. So thanks for the invitation to be on the webinar. It's uh, great to see everyone and even people from my own community because our, our um, leadership here and the people here are taking the COVID-19 very seriously. So we have a curfew and we're very careful about social distancing and, and travel within the territory. Um, so I am at um, Clearwater Lake or what our Cree name for it was a Tigamag, which is Whitefish Lake. And so that's behind there. And that's the, the lake across there is where Omar was talking about a Stony Point, which is one of the land-based camps. Um, so at the University of Saskatchewan, we have a master's program that focuses on Indigenous land-based education. And we've had this for, this is the 10th year actually. So there's been about uh, over 80 graduates from it and most, indigenous, most are Indigenous, but there's also some non-Indigenous people that have um, been a part of it. And so there are people that wanted to get a master's degree, but didn't um, were interested in um, a land-based focus, but interested in a model where they could stay at home, still work and teach. Um, many of them are first language speakers of their native language and they're practicing the culture, but they want to come to spend time figuring out or honing the pedagogy of land-based education. So how do we, pass on land-based knowledge to the next generation. And uh, that, that's what I'm interested in and passionate about. And, um, and that is also um, linked to land protection. So I think that's a big theme in land-based education. And in our territory here, like in other territories, um, we've been impacted by a number of, quite a number of factors. So for us, 
we're a hydro impacted community, but we're also impacted by Ducks Unlimited, um, micro dams and rechanneling the waterways um, by clear cutting. And um, of course, by pollutants that go into the Saskatchewan River system. By the time they get down here, um, uh, sometimes the contaminant levels are quite high. So these are all part of uh, understanding our connection to the land and how our land-based knowledge has been severed in many ways through colonial processes. Uh, so understanding those processes and, and linking back to our deep Indigenous knowledge is uh, something that I um, love to learn about and love to talk with other people about. Wonderful, thank you, welcome. So we're going to start off with um, looking at land-based education as dramatically different now in, in the face of COVID. Um, and there's been so many challenges and barriers that have been um, put up for this, this land-based education. And we're going to circle back um, and I'm going to start with Taylor and Dylan. Um, and then everyone can have an opportunity to put some insight uh, into each, each question that we're, we're talking about here. So Taylor and Dylan, so we are seeing how COVID has changed the delivery of education. You began by mentioning a different program approach of land-based education. Now you said something along the lines of, can you explain that again? And then maybe talk about how land-based education may continue if, if there is no way to get out there on the land still through such webinars or whatever the case might be. So what's happening now is uh, when Kiskinamakwin had began, what we did like last summer was that we visited uh, five different communities and we held four to five day on the land camps. Now with COVID, how we're trying to adjust with that um, is to take what we did last summer and take other teachings and other knowledge that we're learning from from elders, from, from, from scientists at the university, from other students, from our own experiences, and transfer that into online modules, I should say. I'm not really sure how exact, how we're gonna title them, but it's kind of like a toolkit that we're, that we're making with different modules that have different themes. So for instance, there's one on wildlife, there's one on plants and medicines, there will be one on water and wa water quality and the effects of industrial industrialization that's happening up in the north, of course, with hydro dams. And then there's also like fish and fisheries. And then included in those modules will be the science, Western scientific knowledge of like wildlife biology. But then we'll, we're also going to blend in indigenous knowledge and elder stories and then video videos with um, like how to track animals, how to how to build shelters, things like that. So we're trying to just keep the land based. How, how can I say that? We're trying to like keep it alive and well, and just offer offer these different toolkits and these different resources to other communities to encourage them to continue doing what they're doing best, and that's taking the youth and taking the elders back to back to the land and learning from the land because that's so vital and so important, such a huge part of our lifestyle as Indigenous people. So currently that's what we're working on now. So with that in mind, how is, have you been presented any challenges in being able to deliver this program? You know, there are many um, challenges with other communities in their Wi-Fi connection or not having the capability of being able to get this? Is there other methods that you are seeking or looking at to deliver this information to the communities and to the youth? You want to go? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, currently, yeah, exactly what you said, like uh, communication is a lot different right now, especially with Wi-Fi and things like that. But you know, so many a simple phone call always helps <laughs> when when you have the re when you have the phone numbers. So um, it's a lot of the outreach. It is being a bit of a slow process, and I think that right now is the biggest wall that that we're that we're hitting is just is just the outreach portion of it. But we're pretty persistent. We're going to keep trying, and and obviously this is pretty new. I mean, it's kind of weird to think of land based education from a from an electronic device of some sort, right? <laughs> so um, we're still adapting as, as people who are working on this project. 
mm-hmm. and um, we're, we're going to be learning as we're going to. So we're just kind of, we're dealing with what we have here. Absolutely. How about, uh, how about Omar and Crystal? And you've, you've talked about that there is still programming for um, youth through the schools uh, in the north, is there not? And if, if there is, how are they getting the information? And are they able to go out onto the land? Or is there anything? There's a lot of restrictions that are happening in these um, communities. All right. All right. All right. Now, we're going to be on the land. Because of this COVID and the condition, so that's what we have Randy doing right now is through going through the computer system and doing modules on that part of it. But with our education system, they went and purchased a bunch of um, laptops, Chrome, Chrome Chromebooks. So what they'll do is as soon as we'll pick them up, take them home, and then bring them back to ensure that the homework is being done on that part of it. So that's what our education system is doing right now. I think we had like about 500 that came in through the system and right now they're on a short time frame of distrib- distributing them out to the to the students. But also too in the uh, elementary side of it, there's a cereal or bread or whatever is available, right? To kind of the students that are bringing their students to work. But right, right now though, we can't really get on the line well, we can go on the land, but we can't take students because of the numbers. And you could have somebody that may not be sick and the next day have a different group and you may affect somebody. You don't know that, right? So that's why I say I always talk about safety first, because if you do get sick out there, what good are you to the, to the group? So that's one of the challenges that we were, we're talking about. Unless if you take them out there for 14 days and you sit with that group for 14 days. <laughs> but I think it's going to be a while. It's going to be around for a while. It's not going to go away. That's and true. The- Alex, uh, you, uh, you have, um, because you're in a university center, you have a lot of uh, students and, and you deal with people that have a little bit better reception. And now, how are you connecting with everyone? And is it, uh, you know, um, how are you finding that some of these, um, these students and colleagues are being able to connect to the land during this COVID? Yeah, um, it's been a challenge for sure, especially with the land-based cohort, because we have students from Hawaii, um, Zuni Pueblo, Jemez Pueblo, um, New Brunswick. So they're from all over. And some of them are in in places that don't have um, connectivity. Uh, So they've chosen this program because they don't want to do online courses. But now we're in the situation, of course, where we have to. So Um, The two courses they were doing this summer, one is um, querying Indigenous land-based education. So that's an opportunity to really look at how structures of power um, can be kind of inverted and understanding how we can think about land-based education in a way that doesn't replicate colonial processes. And then their other course was their capstone, their final course, where we um, canoe from the um, E.B. Campbell Dam and Nipawin to Opasquayak. So it's uh, all in all, it's about um, 300 kilometer paddle. So they've been really looking forward to that. And now we can't do that. So um, it's disappointing, but we're managing. And I think that's one of the things about us as Indigenous people is that, you know, we have always been able to kind of manage and survive and not only not, not only survive, but thrive. And we've always used technology. The technology has changed. So like guns are a technology, a skidoo, quad, you know, and now we've GPS we use. um, And so now we've got to use this um, distance education. So one of the things that uh, I've been trying to figure out is how, how we're going to continue with the courses this summer. We can't meet in person, but we've come up with a few solutions already. And One is that there's a small group of students that are gonna do a canoe trip in their territory. Um, And the other is that really focusing on micro travel. So micro travel is where you, um, you, even in your yard, you can do it as you can examine like a little plot of land and really enter into a relationship with that land and research it. Um, And the other is like going above and looking at stars, constellations, studying patterns in the sky, etc. So that citizen scientists, I guess, is, is something that um, 
a, a term that people use and Indigenous people, like we've always done research, like we always have been researchers and, you know, we've, we observe and then we adjust our, our behaviors based on things that we learn from observation. We listen, you know, we experiment, we do all of those things in relation to the land. So I think that that's what we can kind of focus on. How can we sit where we are, you know, and for many of us this winter, like we're literally stuck in one place with only one view out the window. But it's amazing like being here, how many things that I've noticed just out that one window for a period of time, like the other day a fox and a lynx went by. And, you know, I don't know if they're always going by and I just haven't noticed or if it's because like there's less human activity now or both, right? Um, so I think now we can take that time to not only observe, but kind of start documenting for ourselves and the next generation, our reflections on our observations, what are our findings, and then um, and then share that as well. So that's kind of, I think, the approach that we're gonna be taking this summer is with our families or with your little unit that you're in isolation with and in relation to the land where you are, literally. Wonderful. I think that that's uh, kind of the key is, is that reflection, as you said, or that citizen science going out and having that that view of of the land through what we can do in social isolation. It's still there. We still can connect at some level. Um, Nikki, you were you were dealing more with land, uh, urban based education and and you had a land and water program. How is that progressing in this COVID challenge? Yeah, so so the program has been heavily impacted in, in similar ways that say Taylor and Dylan's program has been impacted and so typically in the land and water program. Uh, we work with the post secondary team which is made up of like university students as well as like older uh, or young adults or older youth. Um, who might not be enrolled in like a post secondary program and we bring them to a camp so we got to do that back in November, which was really great to like establish this early relationship. Um, and get them on the land and start doing that work. And then typically in the winter term, we start working with a, a like a cohort of uh, grade 10 high school students. Um, and we have sort of monthly, you know, land-based experiences, so to speak. Um, and so unfortunately COVID has really impacted that, of course, with the students not being at school and with social distancing, we haven't been able to meet with the students since February. Um, and and I mean, you know, the students themselves are facing their own engagement, even just trying to engage with like regular school right now. So the kinds of adaptations we've been making are um, to work with that post secondary team to create a set of resources um, for really like a wide age range. So the idea is that there's like a simple resource that could be used for, you know, frankly, you know, children all the way to it, like adults and and uh, older folks. Um, and then it's like the the resources you can add on to them to make them more complex. Um, and so right now we're in the midst of developing that and the idea is to share that with those grade 10 students so that they can still do some of the work of um, reconnecting with the land and exploring their own relationship with the land in their like neighborhoods, for instance, here in the city um, over the summer months and fall until potentially we can meet again. But um, right now we, we realize that we're probably also looking at, you know, next year not being able to get together. And so the biggest challenge is navigating, you know, how to do land-based learning in a group when like we have to meet virtually on Zoom, for instance, um, which we are doing. We're still trying to maintain those connections to develop these resources and um, just to really stay in touch. Uh, but that's, that's a huge challenge is like not having the tech. And then even once we develop the resources, will folks that we share it with have the capacity or the technology they need to actually, do they have a computer? Do they have access to a printer if they need to, you know, print off a, a workbook or something, for instance. So um, those are challenges we're like, we're cognizant of and we're trying to figure out um, how we can like potentially get around them, so. Exactly. And I think, you know, as, as resilient as we are, we do find ways and methods to be able to approach different things. And, you know, if it's, if it isn't being met through Wi Fi and internets and such, you know, being able to have some sort of um, initiative, even by a phone call, as Taylor was saying, you know, you can phone and there's different initiatives that can be done just to have that connection um, for the youth. Um, you know, beyond having that higher level of academic uh, participation. Thank you. 
Um, Omar and Crystal, I'm going to ask you about the role of elders and knowledge keepers. Um, they, it is essential to keep building and keeping that strong connection to the land. And the role of elders and knowledge keepers um, have such a, a deep connection, not only to the land, but also with a relationship with the youth. How do you find that that relationship with youth in your work um, influences them with their, their um, learning in and on the land and what they keep and move forward with or motivate them, so to speak. Okay, okay, I'll go first. Um, in our school programming, with, uh, what's that song? Oh, you got it? With Opasiak Education Services is, uh, and I mentioned that to Michelle there, um, our school every year will um, has a group of elders in our community. Um, we ensure that they have their criminal record check or child abuse, and they become part of the school system in terms of our, our networking and, and people that we bring into our school. Uh, the elders are a vital part of our education system. Um, we have elders that we put into the, the home ec room, let's say, and they teach the students with um, the basic uh, home ec needs of sewing, baking, cooking, any food that is bought in from the outdoor ed program. Uh, they help and assist with the food preparation of the wild well food. And, um, and then in the other, on the other aspect, we have uh, elders that go out on the land with the, the outdoor ed programming, whether it's from K to six or from seven to grade 12. So it's really neat that um, our community acknowledges our knowledge keepers and our elders in our community. And that's one thing that we really stress and we encourage other communities to, to continue doing, to reach out to your knowledge keepers, whether it's a young elder, whether it is a Kateyak, and um, have your list, have your, and like, it's like a toolkit, right? You wanna know the people that are, that have, uh, valuable teachings and uh, um, knowledge that they can pass on to our youth and community. Um, a little more elaborate more on the, what we do for programming. Another another area too we look at is that a lot of our a lot of our students don't really look at the religion or God or or faith in that, the Creator. And I always say something happens for a reason. Or this year having this COVID, our weather really changed lots. It was so cold for the last, I don't know, we probably experienced the longest winter that I can ever remember, but it has to do something. The reason behind to share with our youth in that for sometimes things are meant to happen and not to happen. And that's the kind of awareness we bring to them as well. Well, your weather, even right now with the fishing, that we went fishing the other night and we still have uh, pickerel they haven't did their spawn yet. And by this time, they're already finished. So everything that happens on the land, that happens in the water with the animals and that, it has to do with the weather. But it has to be, you know, there's a reason behind it. I'm not too sure what it is, but, you know, that will be pointed out to, to us down the road. But it also gives us a time to reset ourselves. You know, I found out that we were such in a busy world doing all this and that, and then sit back and relax, and like Alex mentioned, looking through your window and start observing what's out there. And that's something that we talked about between me and Randy with the students and that kind of like slow down and kind of have a look around, start to take that time to observe. And I think that's what uh, in the past, my dad used to tell me all the time, is sit back, relax, you know, if you start missing too much, sit down and just observe and look, regain yourself and then next thing you know, you start uh, harvesting again. So that's just part of a knowledge keeper and what I've taught, what I've seen over the years is that sometimes we need to slow down. <laughs> and this is a good time to kind of sit back and really look at everything and pay attention to the weather and to the animals. They tell you lots. Mm -hmm. I hope that's able to explain to your, your question. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you so much. I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I had discussed even earlier at one point was the bear teachings. I believe I discussed that with Nikki at one point is, is being able to slow down and being able to reconnect and re reset, just press reset. And I think that sometimes 
we just get caught up in, in the pace of, of life that is so moving forward so rapidly that, that this is almost a necessary break is just to just not in the way we would like it, but just to slow down. Nikki, I know that you had um, you have elders that are part of your program as well um, that have really had an impact on being able to have that connection with youth, but also with the students that are that are involved and, and the adults that are involved in facilitating that program that are being trained to, uh, trained to through you. Can you discuss a little bit about that or talk a little bit about that, please? Sure. Um... I, I think like the that elders and and knowledge keepers play a really important role uh, in land based learning because they bring that that deep knowledge that that Alex was talking about and um, a, a story that I want to share about that was actually like two summers ago when we were at the Stony Point camp in OCN or in Opaskwag Cree Nation with Omar and Crystal um, and so Omar and Crystal took us out on I think it was Rocky Lake is is that right Rocky Lake. It feels from okay and so took us out on the lake to um and to set a gill net and then to fillet some fish and the so the experience was really amazing but what wasn't super explicit but was still you know i mean after some reflection that i had really thought about is that there was clear deep knowledge there about you know the the currents in the water and about the wind and like how that would impact like setting that gill net and all of these other factors right like where is the best place and so that doesn't you know you're not born knowing that that's that's come down from like generations of knowledge of like how to do these things and the impact of like currents and wind and other things on on stuff like this so that experience was like really um i think demonstrated the importance of having like these knowledge keepers be a part of things um because like yeah, we could go out and sell, set a gill net, but it's like, if I'm not doing it properly, it's very dangerous and we're not going to catch any fish. And, you know, like, so at the end of the day, it's not like a useful exercise. Um, but that being said, I also want to talk about the importance of involving like younger knowledge holders as well. So um, Michelle's actually a participant in the land and water program. She's a member of the post-secondary team. And so she'll remember from our um, camp in November that we had two elders participating, but we also had two younger knowledge holders um, who really, I think, um, brought something super valuable to the program. Um, and so we had like uh, Justin um, Bear Larivier who showed us how to do, um, who like led us in an exercise to create um, t-shirts using like screen printing. Um, so it was like a design workshop, but it was really tackling this idea of like, you know, that this is Indigenous land, that urban centers are Indigenous land. And then Jenna, um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting her last name right now. Jenna Vandel um, took us on a tour in the Assiniboine Forest, which is like one of the largest urban forests in Canada, and showed us all of these like medicines um, and plants and all this life that was like existing there in, in like really it was like the middle of winter. Um, and the students really loved those experiences. And I, I think there's something useful about involving these younger folks too, because then these like younger learners see them and realize like, wow, these people who are just a few years older than me have something really important to contribute. And, and they have something to work towards that's not just like, maybe when 30 or 40 years when I'm an elder, like I'll have this great knowledge. Like they'll think, hey, when I'm 25, I can be, you know, just as knowledgeable as like Jenna Vandell was. Uh, or is <laughs> so um but you know that being said i think that there's like it's it's important to involve both and that like blending those um which is something we try to do a lot in the land and water program wonderful thank you alex you uh you had talked with me a little bit about what you believe deep knowledge is about and and do you want to expand on that a little bit in this context yeah well i think um just what um uh, nikki was saying and and omar and others as well um that um, what has happened, um, like <clears throat> from here to Saskatoon, if you drive, there's a road we call the Tote Road. <clears throat> and um, last year, two years ago, there was a big pile of um, trees that were cut down. And actually there was another pile this year, but two years ago, we, we measured it and it was almost a kilometer long and it's all old growth boreal forest. And if you think about that, all those trees that are there, um, each of those trees holds knowledge. And um, the question is, if you clear cut the forest 
Um, how does the next generation of trees learn how to be trees? Who do they learn it from? Because their knowledge has been discontinued or disconnected. And in many ways, that's a parallel to what's happened with us and the residential school era and all of that, even though um, you know, we weren't wiped out, we still have that knowledge. So uh, I think that's why the elders are important because they represent that deep knowledge. Um, and, and so reconnecting with them is like um, reconnecting to that, that deep knowledge that, that we need to survive. And, and sometimes it doesn't have to do with age. And, you know, Crystal and Omar are great examples there. They've been knowledge keepers since they were young and they're known in the community for that. Um, and the other thing that happens is I think through the kind of Western schooling system is that we're just taught kind of clip art kind of understandings of indigenous culture. And that can be a little more superficial. So it's material culture that people focus on like activities rather than the way that you do something. So um, the way that you do something can be more important than the actual kind of product. And, and that's kind of the practice that elders were used to. And that's the way that teaching was done um, in the past. So that's what the land kind of forces you to, to do out of necessity, because once you're out there, everybody has a role to play. For some people, it's just observing, or I shouldn't say just, it's observing. For others, it's you know um, physical labor. For others, it's figuring out things. Uh, for others, it's... Um, cleaning, you know, whatever. So everybody has an important role to play. So that's understanding that is the, the deep knowledge rather than saying, well, you know, I skinned for muskrat or something like that, you know, and being able to name the parts of it. So it's a, a knowledge system that is aligned with the land that we're a part of and in relationship to. Absolutely. And I think that Taylor, I wanted to uh, draw this over to you and Dylan, because you work with youth um, in these camps and these science based camps and, you know, the attention span these days is, is just it goes very rapidly. How do you find that uh, you can teach these children or these youth to slow down to be able to get that connection with the land and, and feel that to start feeling that deep knowledge rather than just as Alex said, you know, I've, I've done this, I've hunted, I've skinned, and now, you know, I'm done. Well, I don't really think it's a matter of teaching them how to slow down because the moment that you take these youth onto the land, they feel it's like that connection is almost instantaneous um, and they just get so encouraged. It gives them a sense of, of purpose. It gives them a sense of identity when they're out on the land and learning these skills. I don't think it's a matter of getting them to slow down. It's just a matter of getting them out there. <laughs> Maybe would be a better way to put it is getting them off the tech and not like, well, you know what, but another big thing with our land-based camps that we're working towards is incorporating technology into the camps because in the society, it is very modern. So we have uh, mobile water testing labs where you can actually connect the kits, the, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, like the, the test thing. What am I, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, the instrument. The, test <laughs> the instrument. instrument, sure. Where you can actually connect it to Bluetooth or right to your laptop and get all the results of, of the, the tests that you're running. So that really interests them as well to see everything like pop up on a screen. So there's ways of incorporating both of them, um, which is great. Do you want to add anything? Um. No, I don't, I don't think so. I think it's, it's very important that connection to the land is very important. And everybody, I think most people will feel that too once they're out on the land. If I know, certainly I feel it. I'm in the city right now. And then when I, when I leave the city and I'm out on the land in the bush doing whatever, there's that sense of, of, of placement, I guess you could, you could say. But I mean, I, I can't be the only one that feels that, right? So. Absolutely. No, thank you for sharing and, and your insight on that. I appreciate that. But that really draws us right into our next question here. Nikki, I wanted to talk to you about your work. 
So when we think of land-based learning and, and for the majority of people, when they think of land-based learning, we think of going out of an urban center and getting out on the land and being able to, you know, disconnect from that that urban environment. Um, for many, many people, that is the idea of getting out on the land or land-based learning. But you look at it from a different perspective. You look at land-based learning through an urban environment and how how we need to embrace that and how we can instill that knowledge and that deep knowledge within um, youth and and anyone in an uh, urban setting. So, can you talk about that a little bit, please? Um, so I think, I think like in a sense, the, the story that I shared in my introduction kind of demonstrates the point that I want to make about urban land-based learning, um, is that, you know, I grew up as a child in this like small Métis parish town. And so I was like very connected to, you know, my, my, that was my hometown, but also my homeland. Um, and then when I was about 10 years old, I moved to the city to St. Vitel. Um, and you know, you could feel very disconnected in the city, but I realized, you know, not right away, but I, I realized after a time that that was still my homeland. Like literally my great grandfather was the MLA for St. Vitale and Louis Riel's provisional government. And so, you know, I mean, it was almost in a sense as, as much a homeland to me as Lorette was. Um, and so, you know, I think that people have this idea that land-based learning like only happens in like wilderness camps, for instance. Um, but I think that like if the focus of land-based learning is uncovering these deep knowledge systems and understanding like our ancestral and contemporary connections to the land that we can also do that in urban settings. Um, so there, there's no reason really that land like urban land-based learning can't fulfill the same um, goals, you know, as like a rural or remote um, program could. Um, I mean, I think the the biggest thing that we have to remember is that urban land is still indigenous land, right? Um, and I'm not I'm not just talking about programming that takes place in city green spaces. I don't think you have to go to the park. Like Alex said, I look out my window every day. This is like essentially where I work and I'm looking out my front window and it's like, I'm surrounded by these like very old trees and, and you know, all this, all these things. And, and regardless, even if those weren't there, even if I was living downtown, underneath that concrete is still this like this like, rich sort of clay soil you know that our ancestors you know grew their food from and and um so i think that that people though have this sense that you can't do land-based education in the city and it's something that i'm really wanting to confront in my thesis um because i think um urban land-based learning has such a potential to confront these like colonial narratives that urban spaces are settler spaces right that it's like indigenous people don't belong here we're not as indigenous as like indigenous folks who live you know in remote communities or in reserved communities and so and i think we need to con we need to really confront that head on because it's harmful um it's like a potentially really harmful stereotype so i think urban land-based learning is particularly important for um, for folks who, who don't really have access to these rural and remote spaces either, right? Like we don't want them to feel like they can't still access that, that beautiful feeling that Dylan was describing, right? That feeling of like, I'm connected to something. This is, you know, an indigenous space. This is indigenous land and I can access like my, um, this like, this ancestral knowledge here in this place. I think people can do that in the city. And so we just need to, you know, do the work. Absolutely. I know that with Crystal, um, you were mentioning to me at one point that you take um, before COVID had um, plagued us basically, um, had been an imposition to some of these programs that we wanted to um, do, that you actually would take your students to urban centers or to uh, traveling to do more of this land based connection outside of OCN and, and being able to have that connection. You went to Niagara Falls, for instance, and you know, different ideas like that. How do you how do you see uh, what Nikki is saying about the connection of an urban place and having the um, land-based learning through that, through an ind indigenous perspective? Yeah. There you go. Can you hear me? No. Oh, okay. Oh. Can you hear you? Okay. 
get Michelle to unmute you there. I can't. You're, you're oh, there. Okay. You're good. There we go. <laughs> okay. So for the past, uh, I'd say five years, uh, we had a school group um, that I created with our students. And basically, it's a land-based ed travel group. So like we mentioned, it's important that we take our students out of the community. Um, students are exposed to this territory, Treaty 5, but it's important to introduce them to the urban setting as well or in the city life in itself. So part of the teachings that we uh, instill with our students is their navigation through a, a city area, you know, reading maps, how to, how to travel the system, the transit system, um, seeing different landmarks, uh, the difference in the waterways as opposed and doing the comparisons in the land uh, with what they have from home and uh, what, what's abroad, what's across. So we do our um, trips based on the terrain and the areas that we go to. So for example, we've taken them to Alberta and taken them to Banff. So we've done camping, hiking. Uh, we did hiking of Johnson Canyon. Uh, I've taken them paddling across um, Lake Louise, and then they got to experience that in that terrain with the mountains and um, the different areas of that province of Alberta. Then we went into Saskatchewan, and then we traveled across to um, Niagara Falls. So again, the city, the city part of that is the teaching the students how to go from here to uh, traveling on an airplane, navigating through the airports. And then again, once we're in the city, uh, what do they look for? And uh, in terms of how, what would they do when they're, if they were out there? So it's different teachings that we uh, instill in our students. So when we went out to uh, Niagara Falls, of course they got to see the highlights of marine land um, and seeing the waterfall. So there was always discussion about the land there, the land and the water. So uh, we've always reached out to different um, knowledge keepers in the areas. And then those people would come and share some viewpoints. Uh, we didn't find anyone in Niagara Falls, but uh, the plan was to go back again out east and, and create those networks with uh, different, different people. Uh, we worked along with uh, inner city schools of Winnipeg. Uh, Hugh John McDonald was one school that we've uh, done a a biking trip exchange where we went down, we camped with them, we biked all the way from Winnipeg to Birds Hill Park and then uh, stayed with the group and then we traveled back and then they came down and it was a, it was this time, this time of the year, uh, they got to come down and experience our, our cultural uh, community feast and see and get their hands on with some of the fishing. We took them out to our, our caves and the, the vegetation the area there and the students came from all over the world that were part of you john Mac mcdonald so we had students from africa you know sri lanka and they were eating duck soup having moose nose and that was part of omar's group there the uh, the the outdoor ed program so like i said the importance of our programming is we all enhance each other within the school system of Alpascoiac Education Services. And uh, yeah, so I always promote that, take our kids out of the community, let them see what else is out there, but always instilling the love of the land. Excellent, thank you. Alex, do you have anything that you would like to contribute to that conversation as well? Um, yeah, I'm, I was reading the questions on the side, sorry, I got kind of sidetracked there. <laughs> um, What was the? Uh, it was it, it was really that. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was that connection with the land, with with being able to have an urban environment, oh, yeah, yeah, being yeah, able yeah. to see indigenous. I was still like looking at the Niagara Falls. And the, <laughs> not that Crystal was on there. Um, yeah, so I, I think that um, one of the assignments that we do is uh, students have to observe the moon. And it's not just the moon, but it's, it's cosmology really. So what is our bigger place within the larger universe? But you, you can use the moon as, as an example because it's something that you know people can see. 
and um, to observe the moon for four or five days in a row straight because most people don't actually understand or know you know they may know the sun rises in the east and sets in the west but what does that actually mean how is the earth rotating what's the moon's relationship to the earth how does it influence water and things like that so you can do something like as basic or as as profound actually as observing the moon for a period of days and and just seeing how things work in relationship and um i mean that can be used with as early as third grade grade students they love doing that um and then what do you learn from that so you can reflect on that in a number many many different ways um and then also in relation to that is you can start understanding how the sun and the earth interact and um you know we're coming on up on the summer solstice which was a really significant time for indigenous peoples all, all peoples um pretty much on the planet uh so um that's when we started making our celestial circles so take a note where you know if you if you put a rock in your yard or somewhere where where in relation to that rock is the sun rising on the solstice where is it setting on the solstice so then you can place two rocks there and then you can do that you can do that every day actually and then you'll you'll get a really good understanding of how um, the moon and the and the sun and the earth interact and of course now um, people have like medicine wheel teachings that are, that are actually based on that traditional knowledge of celestial circles so maybe that's an example of deeper knowledge so if you actually observe and start to understand patterns and relationships and spirit and you know how what animates a cycle what animates because water, for example, is not animate and Cree, but in relationship to the cycle, it is, right? Um, so once you start to understand those, then you're getting to much deeper philosophical questions, scientific questions, and that's our deep Indigenous knowledge, rather than just drawing a circle and saying and calling it something and then using it as a teaching tool. So that would be kind of the more... Um, material approach to, to our knowledge. So we have all these opportunities. Um, you know, you don't, you don't have to go way out in the middle of the bush by yourself, you know, they're, they're all right here. And one of the questions about, um, you know, can non-Indigenous people teach this? Certainly non-Indigenous people can um, understand the impact of epistemicide. So that is how did our knowledge systems get severed? So as non-Indigenous educators, I would think that your role is not to try and understand Indigenous teachings, but to understand um, colonial systems, understand racism, understand how racism works, understand homophobia and sexism and how all those work. And then why is it that, you know, resource extraction happens without any kind of protest or things like that, so that you have a better understanding of the social and political context that land-based education is taking place in. And then our elders and our knowledge keepers can pass on that specific knowledge. That's not, that's not for everybody. I mean, it is for everybody that's learning from them, but that's not for everybody to do. So figure out what your role is as an educator and kind of um, um, do your best to find out as much as you can about anti-racism, like how to do anti-oppressive teachings and um, for example. Thank you, thank you for that. And I think that segues right into a question that I had for you, Alex. Um, you strive to ensure that this land-based um, education isn't replicating colonial practices and systems. How do you translate and teach that? Or, or and then may, maybe how can land-based education translate to land defense, as you were saying and expand on that? Yeah, well, I'm wearing my, um... Mauna Kea t-shirt and um, I see we've got some people viewing from Hawaii so hi Tansi aloha to them but um, that's an example is like understand uh, why the people are protecting um, Mauna Kea like why is it that that's so important to protect that sacred space um, so why is it that people are protecting the boreal forest. Um, why is it that the hydro alliance had to even start? You know, 
it's because we've got people that have always since the beginning of our memory as human um, lived in relationship and good relation to the land and the animals in that environment and um, so that's what land that's why the land protection part is important because if, if we don't understand that land protection is important then we have things that continually happen that um, enact violence on the land. And then people don't understand why, why people get angry when, um, you know, when our resources are taken or when our land is damaged and things like that. Absolutely. And, and Nikki, what would you say about, about keeping that, that land-based education, translating that to a land defense, even in an urban environment? Or not? <laughs> no, definitely in an urban environment. Um, <laughs> just like really briefly, I guess I'll say here that, um, you know, like Alex mentioned, like this epistemicide, right, this severing of uh, Indigenous knowledge or traditional knowledge. And I think that, you know, it's like I think of this deforestation um, that's happening in these other things like resource extraction and hydroelectric development that are really impacting um, the land, like in, 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 in really serious ways, right? Um, and there's this quote, and I cannot for the life of me, but after this, I'll put the, the author of this, but he talks about the deforestation of our minds. Um, and so it's like, you know, I think that we need to do this work as Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people um, to make sure that, you know, this isn't, ha that this doesn't continue happening. And I think that land-based education, because it's really about, um, you know, reconnecting to the land and redeveloping these relationships that people come to care, right? Like climate change comes to matter, uh, resource extraction, like the, like land defense, like we are called to that in a sense, once we have, like, once these relationships are strengthened. Um, so I guess that's what I would say off the cuff. And Omar and Crystal, like when you're looking at uh, home uh, communities that are hydro impacted, how do you find that that land based education really connects that that or translate into that land defense? When I started to right now, can you hear me? You're yeah, well, muted. all right, we're good to go. Okay, what I was going to say is that right now we're dealing with the with a dead land because we're stuck in between two hydro dams, a lot of our habitat is gone, like our moose habitat. So the populations have dropped. We have muskrats that have also moved out or died from a disease or whatnot. So a lot of the land we're dealing with right now is dead. And that's something that from now with our students, they're not able to see what I've seen when I was at that age. So it's just trying to, uh, trying to paint the picture for them. Uh, tell them how important it is for water stewardship, how important it is to fight for your territory, how to uh, look at whatnot. Even though these corporate companies like Manitoba Hydro, they give you these senses, but the catch-22 is be careful what you're, you're doing because we're deal, deal, dealing with a dead land. Just like Ducks Unlimited, they came into our territory, there's 104 structures that are there. And right now they're in the process of, of uh, uh, bringing down the control structure. If you look at Bracken Dam, from where I live, uh, just straight up as the crow flies about a mile, we used to see thousands of pickerel do their, and do their migration, do their spawning in that. Um, now you don't even see that. If they take that dam out and they're talking about decommissioning, that's gonna have our inland water all moving through the whole system without no control structures because right now they kind of blocked everything up. So right now we're in a situation right now is that we're trying to paint a picture for our youth. Uh, we're telling how it was back then, just, by, just like right now is that the way my dad used to portray the Laffer season, we call it. Uh, we have to go to out of province to go and hunt our Laffer because of the how they change the migration pattern. I don't know, it could be the water habitat, it could be the, the food source, it could be many factors on that part of it. So that's how, that's what we're dealing with right now. Um, all I can say is all we can do is educate our, our students through the program, paint the picture how it was back then to now, and just see of different ways of how they can educate them. Like I said, if we can educate them, and if they're able to go to a higher level and, you know, advocate for their rights and advocate for their territory, you know, that can make a difference. Because right now, education is almost like the key component because the ways back then to now, 
I think at the table with government and all the third party interests will have an impact on how they do things. Back then our forefathers never did have to do that, right? They kind of go on the land and kind of made their their life or their survival what they need for to plan for the next day or a week ahead. And I know there was a couple of questions I wanted to have an input as mentorship and knowledge keepers is that at the age 21, I was portrayed as a 41 year old because the way I did things, because I was always surrounding myself around the, the, the land, the waterways, my hunting, fishing. So I kind of brought more knowledge because there was a lot of mistakes made, but we learned from those mistakes. And there was a question about uh, urban, urban teachings. We had a group from Winnipeg come and join us on the land when, uh, back in February. And even just going to exercise how to insulate themselves from the ground, what to use, you know, they kind of slept in a, in a trapper's tent, how to make it more comfortable. So even at home, uh, you can put those questions out to the students because they always say, uh, you have to use your, your, your mind and your way of thinking how to do things and how to make yourself comfortable but at the same time to bring safety to it. We can tell them, but if they think about it and they start owning it, that's what has more of an impact. And I think that was part of my teaching growing up is that we're able to use your, to make your things more comfortable for you. And then at the same time, if you're able to use those teaching to your students, make them own it, and they're gonna walk it and breathe it. And then at the same time, that's where your teachings are really gonna sink into an individual. So that's what I would like to, to share with the group. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I'm sure we all do. It was wonderful. Um, Taylor and Dylan, I, I think the going out onto into venturing into developing programs and as as you know you're at your level of coming into teachings and as you know starting your journey into that path of being knowledge keepers, how do you see the the benefit of what we were saying there with um, the education translating to land defense? Go ahead. Yeah, well, I think. Um land degradation or land destruction directly impacts um, land-based learning just because uh, that's kind of, I, I see land-based learning as, as kind of the base or the foundation of pretty much everything we use in life, right? Everything comes from the land. Everything we make comes from the land. So um, if we continue to destroy our environment, cut down trees, poison our waters. That's what, what left are we going to have to learn from or even, or even use as, as humans. Right. So, um, absolutely. I think those, those two topics go hand in hand when you're, when you're talking about, um, degradation or even remediation of, of land or, um, um, animals too, other beings out there. Understood. Taylor, did you have anything to add? No? No, no, no. Okay. Is there anything that anybody else would like to add before we go into a, a, a few of the questions? I would like to add one thing. Can I add sure. one thing? Please. Okay. Real quick though, but I, uh, it was a thought that I was having right before we started uh, this, this conversation was uh, one, one another big important aspect to me about land-based education is how it it's kind of answering one of the truth and reconciliations calls to action which asks for more funding to be made available for for youth and indigenous peoples to get onto the land so i think that the promotion and us doing things like this uh, the webinar and everything to 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 bring light more light to land-based education is important in that reconciliation process for indigenous peoples in canada as well yes thank you for sharing that absolutely all right i'm going to actually um there's been a few questions that have been posed to me um one of them i'm going to ask for your input on uh, Someone had asked, how do we ensure that this knowledge, this land-based knowledge, Indigenous knowledge, does not become um, 
Well, they use the word plagiarized by schools, government as claiming as their own, as their own curriculum, as their own knowledge. How do we, how do we challenge that? How do we navigate that? Alex, do you want to start with that? Um, well, pro probably, oh, it's a tough one because they're talking about cultural appropriation, right? And we've had so much of our knowledge and our bodies and, and our land kind of taken without permission or consent. Uh, so that's why I think it's really important that Indigenous people lead the Indigenous land-based movement, for one. Um, and that we lead uh, the development of any kind of curriculum around that. And then, um, you know, every community is different. Every land, every landscape is different. So it's land-based education is so contextual um, that it's really, it's really hard to think about how you could have some kind of a universal statement saying, you know, this is ours, you can't have it. But at the same time, we know the history of, of exploitation. So I think it's an ongoing discussion. I don't have a lot, many answers for that other than um, the one that I started with. And that is that Indigenous people lead it. And that's what's being done. Yes, Crystal, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Do that. Let's see. Okay, we got it. Okay, we got it. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, okay, uh, okay. Good. All right. Uh, when I started teaching in 2007, so this is 2000. That's yours. Yours. Okay. You got it. I think we got it. We're sitting across from each other, Omar and I here. <laughs> so uh, in 2007, I started teaching in the classroom and I um, began land-based teaching with grade five students then. And I had uh, a look at the uh, social studies curriculum from Manitoba Ed and, and worked with that in terms of my planning. Uh, ten, 10 years later, when I look back at the same social studies curriculum, I've noticed that over the years, when we provide information to people, to specialists that come into our communities, whether they're from a you know curriculum background and that, uh, the stuff that we put out there as First Nations uh, education systems from First Nations, Manitoba Ed has taken that and, and called it their own and have added those teachings as part of their curriculum. So for me, that's that's my dilemma, and that's one area that. Uh, one area that I wanted to study on and, and to promote that in terms of, you know, our knowledge and, and teachings, it needs to stay with the community. It needs to stay with that land. Our, our teachings, our knowledge is based on our geographical locations. My location is different from somebody from um, Rankin the Inlet. Uh, same thing when we go east or west. So those teachings are vital to us and our people and including the language. When we look at that curriculum today, you know, it upsets me because those are the teachings that we've seen in our community that others have, have shared. Now they're putting it into their curriculum. When we try and develop something original in our community for a SIC, which is a school initiated program for crediting, we're writing curriculum, but then Manitoba Ed comes back and says, your information here um, is basically the same as our curriculum. And then, and I'm looking at that and I'm saying, and I'm thinking, this is our teaching. This is what we want to teach our youth. It's how you have put it on paper. You've, you've, um, um, how they take our information and make it their own. So that's what's happening in our systems. We're losing the, uh, the um, importance of, of keeping the sacredness of our own areas and our teachings and we're challenging we're finding that challenge with Manitoba Ed and and these specialists that come in they take our information now when we try and develop something we can't they send it back oh we can't 
we won't uh, credit you yet uh, to make this a school credit. It has to be 50% uh, of a difference from our curriculum. So that's one of the things I'm going to be working on in terms of my uh, next steps for my master's is ensuring that and bring that to light because uh, everybody has different teachings that is so vital to their geographical location but we're losing that because we have people that don't understand that there are some things we shouldn't be writing there's sacredness to that we need to honor that for our elders and our generations to come yeah. absolutely Sorry. absolutely and it is a challenge to be able to deal with the politics of getting into that type of system and and how you know to not reiterate um keep doing the same as uh, has has been done and, and being having our the knowledge taken and, and used and claimed as their own and and it's it's definitely a challenge i'm sure that you face that as well alex in in teaching at you know at a university level and and nikki as well um with what you're facing in your graduate studies as well would you have anything to add to that I guess just just really briefly that I would say that you know some really important principles here are like consent and acknowledgement so like having you know the consent and permissions from folks when you're sharing that knowledge that you can share it that it's something that's shareable um, and that you can share with your particular audience um, and then acknowledging where those teachings came from so you know I mean it's like we like if I were to just start sharing teachings and not saying, well, you know, I learned that from my teacher, Barbara, or my teacher, Charlotte, that it's like, you know, where is that information coming from and where did I learn that? So to question those things. Um, and so I guess with that being said, I learned everything I know from Alex Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, what do you have sure, to say about that? Pressure on me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like, we have to credit my dad then. <laughs> and Omar and Crystal and everybody else. <laughs> Absolutely. Omar, yes, you wanted to say something. You're on mute. Control A. Eh? There you got there it. You. OK, what I was going to say is what I was taught is that you're always, you can share. You can provide the tools you need to be out there. Anybody can copy or mimic or take those tools at work, they'll never be the same because everybody's different and it's how you incorporate those tools. I know I was listening to my wife talk about it, you know, we, um, we have kind of like a two different views. For me, I can give you any, I can show you anything you want. It's up to you to grab or take what works best for you, but you'll never do it the same way I do it because we develop our own personality. And that's what we explain to our students. So, even with somebody, like I said, we get a lot of people that come through our system. How do you guys do this? How do you do that? We'll show them. But what works for us as a team within our, our location, around OCN, we created that because you have, because we created our own style. Our style might be different from right and Inlet. You know, that's what I say about going to Churchill. The way we do things here with our students and how we hunt, is totally different how you would do in a different uh, location because you're always adapting. <laughs> and being a hunter and being an advocate on the land, you have to change your game plan all the time because you're looking at safety, you're looking at the weather, you're looking at uh, what you have for now and what you're going to need tomorrow. So we're always adapting. And that's the, the beauty about land base is that you're always, your mind is always going 100 miles an hour, but at the same time, you have to take the time to slow down. And having this uh, situation that we're going through right now, it kind of slows everybody down. They have um, how they rethink things and that. And like I said, you talk about information. I'll give you anything you want to learn. I'll tell you the way we do it. But as soon as you are outside in a different community, you're, 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 your mind is going to change because there's always a different way, a different style. Uh, there's always, uh, this is the way I was taught. And I'm always open for that. You know, this is the way I was taught from my mom. But if I look on to a different person, it might be easier. So you're always adapting. So I just thought I'd share that with you and that, that part of it. You know, we what do you gain out of it? What works for best? And that's what we tell our students. Whatever works for you, 
and how you achieve it in the safe, comfortable zone that you feel comfortable, by all means, go for it. So I just thought I'd share that with you. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Yes, everybody does adapt and, and needs to go at what works best for them and being able to honor that, honor the teachings that they have had as well from their own families. It's it's not one way, it's, it's whatever way that works best for them. Um, we're going to be wrapping up soon. I wanted to ask, though, um, just a couple of questions that you guys, that, that all of you as, as panelists can maybe speak to. One is, what do you think the importance of uh, languages in teaching land-based um, education of, of Indigenous language of, of, from your community? Uh, let's start with uh, Taylor and Dylan. Uh, yeah, I think uh, language is one of the top priorities um, into this land land-based teaching or or outdoor teaching like that, but. I feel like that because language, our, it, it almost reflects worldviews. Our, right? lang our language is based off the land. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, and obviously with, with um, history, a lot of that disconnection from language had significant impacts on Indigenous peoples, right? So to revitalize that, that's just a, um, um, a catalyst to, to, to further educate and benefit the people in the community. Absolutely, Alex. Yeah, I, I agree that um, language is so, you know, it, it came out of, um, it came out of our relationship with land. That's how it developed. And <clears throat> um, I wanna just touch on one thing that um, Omar kind of ended with and, and you talked about, and that's like, everybody has their own kind of teachings and um, I think for educators, it's really important to remember that um, when we're doing um, passing on knowledge in a community kind of structure or in your family kind of structure, it's different than when we're passing it on in a school structure or a formal education structure. So there's a, a bit of a, a different layer of accountability that's, that's, um, that's important. And I'm bringing this up because sometimes um, Two Spirit and LGBTQ students have not been comfortable in land based um, programs because um, maybe they're required to wear certain women usually are required to wear a certain kind of clothing or sit a certain way and all that and um, it's really important to when inviting elders or language speakers or whoever's coming or whoever's a part of your land-based programming to ensure that they're going to be welcoming to everybody in the circle and you know that's why um, we appreciate Omar and um, Crystal so much is because they are they are very inclusive and welcoming and open to different ways of being and thinking and I think that um, just to be open to the possibility that uh, there is diversity in humans as much as there is diversity in nature. So that's kind of the message that I, I would like to, to end with. Thanks. Thank you. Crystal? Omar, what do you have to say about language and, and that connection to the land? Okay. <laughs> Again, back to the land, our language does stem from our. Okay. <laughs> I'm muted again. Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, so the land does define our language. And um, when we look at a past act as land rises and we listen to our own, our own language, uh, people will acknowledge you guys have this pitch. Um, where we talk and then it slowly goes down. And then we talked about different areas and we analyze in our discussions about um, areas that have rocky rocky areas, uh, little hills and that. And, and we talk about how the language flows in that pattern. And then whereas people that uh, live in the plains, their, their language is so smooth and fast. So again, we look at those things and discuss those areas of uh, how the land impacts our language and uh, where we come from. 
Absolutely. Nikki, what would you say? Um, I think I would echo what, what you, what's been said already is that, you know, language is sort of this gateway into our, like our worldview and um, the way that we make meaning of the world, word, world, geez, uh, it's getting late, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that with respect to land-based um, learning, you know, place names are something really interesting that you can incorporate. And because indigenous languages are typically like descriptive and relational, there's like, this opportunity to talk about what was our connection or our relationship with this place through these like place names. Um, so I think that's a great way to incorporate language. You know, Michelle in the Land and Water Program, we played like Michif language games, you know, just for, for, for some fun. Um, but I, I mean, I don't think you need to be a first language speaker to be a land-based educator, but I, but I, you know, I mean, um, it, it can't hurt. So I think it's probably a great thing to incorporate if you can. Absolutely. I, th I think that that being able to reconnect with the language that we have lost because that is so much ingrained a part of who we are and, and where we come from and our ancestors as well. It's, uh, it's a really vital component of that land as well. Is there anybody else that would like to say anything before I wrap up? Are we good? Well, thank you each and every one of you so, so much for being a part of our conversation today on um, land-based education. I want to extend you know, our thanks to Omar and Crystal and Dr. Alex Wilson, students Nikki Ferland and Taylor Galvin and Dylan Kensick. Thank you so, what? so much. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to wrap this up for today. I just wanted to remind everyone that we are going to be doing more webinars in the future that will include some pretty interesting topics such as food sovereignty. We're hoping to aim towards one every couple of weeks. However, we will see where that goes, but we definitely will keep you posted um, through our Facebook and our websites uh, so that you will be able to have that opportunity to partake in that as well. And we also are going to, um, I just want Taylor to, talk about her podcast again you have uh, something that's happening tomorrow is it taylor yeah the acuan podcast episode two Nungam, which means today in ojibwe is going to just be talking about um how people are kind of facing covid it's not going to be a covid podcast it's just going to be how we're dealing with covid I, life I am by far <laughs> far from a medical expert so i ain't talking about that <laughs> <laughs> thank you and that happens does that happen every friday uh, May 15th or the 15th and 30th of every month, there'll be brand new episodes. Um, so yeah, tune in. They all have a different theme. Our first one was uh, Aki, which was the land. And then we did a launch and learn and we'll have one called Nibe, which is water and you, so and so. <laughs> and if you would like to learn more about uh, Kiskinamakwan program, you could check out landlearning.ca. And there's, uh, there's a few resources and pictures of past okay. camps. And um, we also have a Facebook page, um, Kiskinamakwan. Uh, we could spell it out in the comment section, but uh, yeah, check it out and um, have a good day. Well, we will add all of those links as well to our webinar um, page so that people will have that information so they can go to it for anybody that actually was um, able to attend or those that are going to be tuning in at a, at a later time that weren't able to be here live today. They'll have all of those links. So that'll be great. And then one last thing with the COVID-19 Indigenous Project um, at COVID19Indigenous.ca, you will notice that we are running a... a um, a community stories um it's not a contest so to speak but it's it's being able to submit a picture or a story or something how COVID has impacted you in your community that would be able to um, be entered into a chance to win 100 dollars through the the initiative so if anybody is interested in doing that please check out our website at covid19 indigenous.ca I and mean, again we will link that information below a big thank you to each and every one of you again. I really enjoyed our time here today and stay well, keep well. And goodbye. Hey, Michelle, you see my hunting grounds and my training grounds? <laughs> ah, oh, that's, lovely. That's, that's where everything starts when I was four years old. Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> it's lovely. <laughs> All right, have a good night. Have a good you weekend. Too. Bye-bye. Thank you.